This is an HP News Network special report. Okay, YouTubers and anti-nuclear activists, welcome to another special report. And all of my reports are, yes, very special because radiation is especially dangerous. Nuclear meltdowns are especially dangerous. Fallout is especially dangerous. Aerosolized plutonium for MOX fuel is especially dangerous. So yes, these are all going to be special, very special reports. Okay, I want to remind you as well, I've upcoming, I'm still working on it, I'm close to being done, my Unit 4 compendium. It's going to be a prolific amount of evidence that will contradict a lot of what you're hearing in the alternative and a lot of what you're not even hearing, the disinformation in mainstream. It's that bad in mainstream. Uh, also, I, thanks to Shazam, I have some information on the NEI database from the nuclear power plant rooftop grabs here in the United States immediately following the Fukushima catastrophe. And we have some measurements from that and some information upcoming on that. So that's also blockbuster extremely big because I didn't think I was going to have access to any of those numbers at all. And I'm working on getting my presentation on that ready. So stand by for that soon to come. Okay, for this episode, we want to jump right in. And we're going to look at the Bechtel pumps. I want to talk about the Bechtel pumps that were shipped from Perth, Australia in an effort to save Japan from the catastrophe. I want to talk about potassium iodine and how the NRC passes the buck when it comes to the United States and our individual stakeholders here at the states. Whether it's Illinois or New York or whatever state you're in that has a nuclear reactor, I want to talk to you about how the NRC passes the buck as far as potassium iodine and other things as well. I want to talk about the bladder farm bladder farm. This was totally new to me, never heard of it, mind-blowing, very interesting, and it also strikes to the amount of radioactive water uh, that they have at Fukushima, at least what was contained inside some of these turbine buildings. And finally, I want to revisit the Price-Anderson Act. I already did a broadcast on this and we talked about it, but I found evidence to do some compare and contrast because the Price-Anderson Act says you have a, a, some money at the, their disposal in case there's a meltdown here in the states and there are damages but how much does it cover? I mean is it realistic? Let's have a look at that. So let's jump right in with the Bechtel pumps and I want to read you from a screen capture from an email from March 19 at 7.18 p.m. and again this is from LIAO2 Hawk that some kind of committee is the best I can figure out on that. It's a group of people working together and this is sent to Brooke Smith, Kirk Foggy, subject 6 p.m. teleconference synopsis. And this is in regards to the Bechtel pumps. Hi, Brooke and Kirk. Thought you might like a synopsis of the 6 p.m. teleconference regarding the Bechtel pumps that are staged in Perth, Australia. Issue. Cost initially discussed was $750,000. Current cost, approximately $9.6 billion. Apparent miscommunication between Bechtel and NRC regarding cost. You said originally green lighted the delivery based upon the initial cost of 750000 then halted action based upon new estimated cost of $9.6 On the call, you said informed everyone that this was not coming out of their funding, that it would be coming from DOD, Department of Defense. Per Kathleen Martin at you said, is that DOD Paycom has authorized up to $10 billion for delivery of the requested pumps. Therefore, officials were attempting to confirm DOD funding and provide flight authorization for the first pump, which is partially loaded in Perth, Australia. The thought now is to authorize the delivery of the first pump, which is staged and partially loaded on a plane in Perth, and put the remaining pumps in standby pending need determination from the Japanese. Per NRC at Hawk, Japan stated they would accept the pumps and put them into secondary or tertiary use at the site. GEH also agreed to assemble and test the pumps at their location in Japan before they are dispatched to Fukushima Daiichi. Chuck Castro and John Moniger were both on the conference call. I'm sure they can provide you with additional details if you require them. 
Okay, let's look back at this. Okay, you see there's a discrepancy in the cost and how it jumps from 750000 to $9.6 billion because there's a miscommunication. I'll leave you to decide if someone's intentionally bilking American taxpayers. I can't say that for certain. And let's continue to look at more from this particular email. What you notice is it says the Japanese are prepared to accept them and put them in standby pending need determination. Put them into secondary or tertiary use at the site. Okay, that's important because my mom reminded me today that in the documents early on, Japan's not really crazy about these pumps. They don't really want them. They're not that interested in them. And it's kind of pushed off on them. As you can see the evidence here, they would accept them and put them into secondary or tertiary use at the site. So they've already got something there that's their main uh, means of trying to stabilize and cool and inject seawater into the reactors. And this is going to be a secondary or tertiary uh, use at the site. Also interesting to note that it says GEH, I believe that's a company that's, or the technicians or whatever that's going to assemble. Uh, they agreed to assemble and test the pumps at their location. I read somewhere in these documents where they said that the technicians were willing to go to Japan and help assemble and show them how the pumps are assembled and to work the pumps, but they wouldn't do it on site. It had to be at a remote location due to the radiation. The technicians were not willing to go on site to work with these pumps. The Japanese had to figure them out and go on site themselves to do it. Okay, and the next screen capture, very briefly, I want to show you as an update and it's from the 19th of March and it says update on Bechtel trains in Perth for Japan DOD Department of Defense Paycom has confirmed payment and flight is being prepared so they were paid for by John Q taxpayer which is DOD is funded by American taxpayer that much I can tell you okay that's what I wanted to show you on the pumps that's the issue of the pumps we're paying 9.6 billion Japanese didn't really make a, a point to insist on them per se although they did accept them in the end but they're for secondary or tertiary use they've already got something going on and maybe they're using them maybe they're not but why are the Japanese my point being why are the Japanese not paying the 9.6 billion why am I footing the bill on that okay, I mean in the end I'm willing to help do whatever it takes obviously but in the interest of fairness, I, you know, I'd like the person to finance it who's most responsible for the incident. Okay, now let's talk about how the NRC passes the buck with potassium iodine. We're going to look at a series of emails here. This first one's from the 18th of March, just seven days after the disaster. Subject, KI Pills, from Amy Bonacorso. To Scott Burnell, David McIntyre, Holly Harrington, all big players in the Plumegate cover-up. And Amy says, what are we telling people who want to know where to get KI? If I say there is no danger, it's still a potentially weak answer because FEMA always tells people to be prepared. Next screen capture, March 18th, Scott Burnell. Firing back to Amy Bonacorso, David McIntyre, Holly Harrington. RE, KI Pills. Amy, please double check with Dave and Holly since my coffee hasn't kicked in, but here goes. Isn't there some QA language to the effect of, quote, listen to your state and local authorities. They'll be the best source of information on actions appropriate to your area, end quote, that we can use, Scott. Again, this strikes through the Q&As in this prefabricated control of questions and answers. They do not want an open debate. They do not want an open debate where you can ask any question and follow up on that question. They want to control the question. They want to control the answer. They want a one-way press release. They want Q&As. They want talking points. Okay, next screen capture. This is following in the line. It says, yes, that is the language. Coupled with, we do not expect unsafe levels, etc., etc. From Holly Harrington in response. Next screen capture. Amy Bonacorso is responding, okay, I will use that. That's what they're going to use. Hey, refer to state and local, and we don't expect harmful levels, okay? Now, here's a email from the 14th where I want to show you how they're funneling and controlling the information, and they're not free with the information. They're not forthright with information. They are very controlling with information, even to U.S. states, even to our own NPP operators here in the United States. Okay, and this is again from LIA06. It's another hawk kind of committee with a group of people, but you can see who it sent out to, the usual suspects. 
with Elliot Brenner, the ringleader in there, and says this is email is primarily for Charlie and Rosetta to close the loop. We discussed the need for providing consistent information to the states via the RSLOs, that is the Regional State Liaison Officer, that's the contact for them in the state, via the RSLOs with the executive team and the chairman a few minutes ago. The chairman directed us to coordinate with FEMA since they have an established relationship with the states. Might I add, FEMA's already been ordered to stand down. They've already been ordered to stand down. We settled on working with OPA, Office of Public Affairs, to provide the information tailored to our best extent to the questions and concerns that would be expressed by the states and provide to FEMA for awareness and commonality and then the RSLOs for sharing. A broad conference call with all states is not currently being contemplated. We'd like to see how providing a common set of information works first. Okay, let's go back to the section, first section I have underlined. We settled on working with OPA to provide the information tailored to our best extent to the questions and concerns that would be expressed by the states. In other words, they're assuming what the states would ask. How convenient, how convenient. Let us assume what these stakeholders in the United States at the nuclear power plants there, what questions they might ask. We'll give them those questions so they can ask them to us, right? They're controlling even the questions that the states would want to ask and provide to FEMA for awareness and commonality. Again, we all want the same story. If we're withholding something, we all want to withhold it. If 90% of us withhold something and 10% of us go ahead and give it out, okay, again, easier to catch a liar than a one-legged man. Okay, so what you see is this control factor where ultimately the RSLOs are going to speak with the state and they're prompted with the information. They're prompted with this set of questions that they assume the states would want to ask about this. Now let's move to the next screen capture. This is the critical one where I make my point here. And let me read to you what this says. This is part of a briefing from the FOIA documents, NRC FOIA documents. It says, Mark Schaefer has requested permission to share the NRC sit rep with the Chinese government. OIP is working. OIP was advised this document should not be shared. Concerns with any plan to share the SITREP with the Chinese government are, one, U.S. states have been denied access to this document. And two, if we share the document with the Chinese government, this precedent could obligate us to honor requests from other international stakeholders as well. As we learned with the New York Times article, we need to safeguard against leaks of official use only information. Well, what is official use only? Hey, that's the most damning measurements and reports and data and information on what's really going on in this triple China syndrome meltdown with very likely spent fuel pool number four is a melt on the floor. The worst of the worst has already happened and they don't want that getting out and certainly not to US states. Let me repeat to you again, uh, point number one of this particular briefing, U.S. states, United States, states have been denied access to what document? The Situation Report. The Situation Report, which is the reality on the ground as they can best surmise at this point. So if we backtrack to this other particular screen capture we just looked at, Yes, they're providing a tailored information, tailored questions to the states. And what's not going to be in, in those questions, what's not going to be prompted in there, is that with the details in the situation report, they're denying critical information to our states, American states. Okay, that's just a fact. Okay, and this next screen capture, I want to read to you the transcription of a back and forth between former Chairman Jaxco of the NRC and Representative Markey, who have a very high opinion of Representative Markey above all. He's one of the few that actually really pressed, asked hard questions, and gave him a hard time. I mean, he had NRC running around sweating bullets over his questions, okay? And he, he stuck with it. He didn't just ask questions and forget about them. The guy was relentless. Okay, let's look at this back and forth. Mr. Jaxco, and this is in regards to potassium iodine. Well, the particular protective actions that would be issued for any nuclear power plant incident are ultimately the responsibilities of the state and local governments. They have that primary on-the-ground responsibility to decide how to deal with an accident. So, Representative Markey, 
But the plants are licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, not by the states. You're the agency of expertise in terms of the spread of nuclear materials, not state officials. Do you believe that it is advisable to look at a 20 mile radius for distribution of potassium iodine? Very relevant question. Mr. Jaxco, the current policy of the commission is that potassium iodine would be one of the protective action that could be considered within what we call our emergency. Mark interrupts again. The Bush guideline was that for 10 to 20 miles, people should just stop running or ducking under their bed. Do you think that there is no other medicine? So is there, is there a recommendation from you that they should look at potassium iodide for the 10 to 20 mile radius? Mr. Jaxco. Again, I would really in many ways defer to state and local governments as they believe that that's appropriate. I think that there are certainly are many protective actions that could be taken. Again, avoiding the question, obviously answering the question. Marky cuts in again. I just don't think that they have the expertise, referring to the states, I just don't think that they have the expertise looking at the probabilistic risk assessment of the likelihood of an accident in terms of having KI there. Well, he really in a nutshell is almost summing it up. They don't have the expertise, and I would look at Representative Markey and say, Mr. Markey, sir, with all due respect, they don't have the information. They are simply not being given access to all the information the NRC has. They're meeting it out a little bit of time, letting out what they want to let out in damage control, trying to avoid the American public finding out the truth about the damage at Fukushima. Okay, and that's what this strikes you. When I say they're passing the buck, they say, well, the states know and the states will know. Well, how are the states going to know, NRC? How will the states know whoever's head of the NRC now, and Jax goes down the road and he's gone, Okay, whoever's the head of the NRC now, how are they supposed to know that based on a total lack of information that you give the states because you're withholding the sit rep? Do you think that some of this information would be pertinent and important for states to have to make an informed decision? Yes, they can make a decision, but I ask you, Mr. Jaxco, or whoever's head of the NRC today, would it be an informed decision? Would it be an informed decision when I show you evidence, you withhold important information, not just even from our states, but from international stakeholders? Okay, so let's have a look now. Let's talk about the bladder form, which was really just kind of uh, very interesting for me. This is another one from Shazam, who's dug this up from the NRC Freedom of Information Act documents that are free and available to the public online. I will link to the NRC for your documents so you too can dig through these and help expose the truth about nuclear power. Okay, let's have a look at the first screen capture. Uh, this is from the 29th of March, subject contaminated water at Fukushima Point Paper. From Matusak George J, Major United States Air Force, uh, U.S. Forces, Japan. Okay, let's look at the second screen capture and see what he has to say. Point Paper on contaminated water at Fukushima plant. Problem. TEPCO has reported standing contaminated water in the basements of the reactor buildings at Fukushima and has asked the United States government for assistance with dealing with it. Assumptions. The exact amount of water is unknown, but we are estimating at least 5.2 million gallons of contaminated water. Parentheses, this assumes that all three reactors and turbine facilities have standing water. Close parentheses. Additionally, it is believed that a leak in the facility exists and is shedding an unknown amount of water to the environment and ocean. Finally, the water itself is contaminated with both iodine and cesium. Options for treatment. Water treatment. Reverse osmosis. Water purification unit. Currently, there are only 14 ROWPUs available in Japan and they have been set aside for base water production if required. Only one set of NBC filters comes with each ROWPU nuclear biological chemical filters comes with each ROWPU and the life expectancy of these filters is 100 hours filter flow rate of NBC filters is 7 to 11 gallons per minute thus each set can clean 66,000 gallons filter cleans 95% of contamination unknown if that meets government of Japan or United States government standards for release storage here we go Use 200K gallon fuel bladders to store contaminated water. 200,000 gallon fuel bladders to store contaminated water. Currently, there are six fuel bladders 
at Atsugi, that's the Air Force base there, with another 74 bladders at Sagami General Depot, giving us a total storage capacity of 16 million gallons. Lay down area for each bladder is 50 feet by 20 feet, and each bladder weighs 6,000 pounds empty. Huge, 20 foot by 50 foot, six much as a car, more than a car empty. Recommendation, due to the immediate need to gain control of the contaminated material, it is best to move forward with the storage bladder option as soon as possible. Once the contaminated water is contained, suitable decontamination methods, including commercial options, can proceed at a later date. And it's all about timeline and how long it's going to get to set it up and so on and so forth. And it says sizing of pumps and hoses to fill the bladders would depend on distance of quote unquote bladder farm from reactor buildings as well as the desired speed of transfer. Now, I don't know if this ever came about or if they ever got bladders and began to fill bladders with contaminated water, but you know it would stand to reason if Google wasn't censoring their uh, Google Earth, you would be able to zoom in and look in nearby proximity to Fukushima. You would be looking for this bladder farm where there would be you know, 70, 80 of these 20 foot by 50 foot huge bladders in a nice level spot where they would be storing contaminated water. Okay, let's look at the next screen capture from April 5th. Matsuo, Kinji Matsuo, subject, TEPCO, earthquake information update on April 5, result of radioactive water spilled to the sea. Again, what we've been trying to do is show you guys in these documents that there's plenty of evidence, prolific evidence, that in March and April, TEPCO officials were open and admitted to other officials, NRC would know, DOE would know, NISA would know, that they had to discharge water into the sea. They had no choice. Water was leaking into the sea. Water was spilling over these pits into the sea. And so they, while they might not have been completely honest with the amount, okay, they, they did have to fess up and say, yes, it's leaking into the sea. So while mainstream remains totally silent on that, much of alternative media remains totally silent, we begin to break this. Kevin Blanche has been on this since day one, okay? But I'm showing you from these documents indisputable evidence that our guys, our side, knew the whole time. So they remain very quiet and hush-hush about this as they're protecting the nuclear industry. It says, Dear friends, here are updates on radioactive material released from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station and information on IAEA's visit to the sites. Outflow of fluid, number one, outflow of fluid containing radioactive materials to the ocean from areas near intake channel of Fukushima Daiichi NPS Unit 2. Prince's continued report. Talk more about that in just a second. Number two, measures taken to stop outflow of radioactive fluid to the ocean from Unit 2. And in my opinion, it's a laughable what they're going to do to try to stop this radioactive fluid from flowing to the ocean. And at the bottom of the screen capture, it's important to note says right there, TEPCO, Washington office. They got an office over here. All these guys work together. They're all in bed together. What one hand knows, the other hand knows to some extent. And they're very tight with information. No, TEPCO is not extremely forward with all their information, but enough that our guys had a really excellent idea, and thus the plume gate cover-up, as we were denied that information, and thus we couldn't take precautionary measures to stay out of the rain, pregnant women to stay out of the rain, so on and so forth. Okay, let's look at the next screen capture. Number one, outflow of fluid containing radioactive materials to the ocean from areas near intake channel of Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Station Unit 2. Continued report. The highlighted section is what we're interested in here. TEPCO detected water containing radiation dose over 1,000 millisieverts per hour in the pit where supply cables are stored near the intake channel of Unit 2 on April 2. Furthermore, we identified a crack about 20 centimeters on the concrete lateral of the pit from where the water in the pit was outflowing. Okay, there's evidence again, radioactive water's outflowing and where is it going to eventually has to go to the sea, quite obviously. Okay, next screen capture in this highlighted section is going to blow your mind. This is the countermeasure they took to stop the leak of radioactive water. Number two, measures taken to stop outflow of radioactive fluid to the ocean from Unit 2. In the afternoon on April 3, we injected 20 sets of sawdust, approximately 60 kilogram, 80 sets of polymer, approximately 8 kilogram, three sets of newspapers, 
and 2.5 meters cubed of water to the trench for power cable of intake channel and stirred. No, this is not emerald. This isn't a cooking show. The emerald part was a bam when the things exploded, right? This is their attempt to plug and stop that 20 centimeter leak. What are they using? Sawdust, polymer, newspapers, and stir. Afterward, it goes on to say, we observe the changes of water level inside the pit and the amount of outflow to the sea. However, as of 9.30, April 5th, we could not observe any changes in the amount of the outflow. It goes on to say they injected a tracer and what have you to, that's what you would do to kind of see where the leak's coming from and see where the leaks are at. And that makes sense. You know, and at the bottom it says something about in order to reduce the spread of the radioactive contamination to the sea. Again, I just want to show you and bolster my case that they've known all along they're dumping, discharging, overflowing pits, radioactive contaminated water into the Pacific Ocean. It's quite clear and there's abundance of evidence, although on, it seems on the United States side as well as the Japanese side, they've been very quiet about this and they're only willing to let it come out when we expose it first and force their hand and force them to talk about it. They look like total nincompoops, right? Being nice using the word nincompoop, right? I don't usually normally use that word, but it just came out of me all of a sudden. Now check it out. Here we go. Price Anderson, let's look at this. And then we're out of here for another uh, special report from Hattrick Penry. Here's a March 24th email from Scott Burnell. And this is a subject, Price Anderson, QA, questions and answers, ready to use. These are good to go, folks, he says. Look, he's all happy and everything. He's been hard at work on his Q&A. He's working hard to control the information in the form of the question and to give you the answer to the question they just gave you, your own question. They want you to ask a question that's not even yours. Your question, their question, see, we don't even get a say in it, do we, folks? Okay, next screen capture. It is confusing. It's very confusing when someone tells you the question that you're going to ask them, right? Okay. Next screen capture, March 24th. Are these appropriate for the web? Elizabeth Hayden asks. Are these appropriate for the web? When you look at these Q&As, the guy's not giving out a whole lot of information. He's not really connecting dots and making a big um, presentation about it. He's, he's a minimalist on this. You're going to get the minimal amount of information. I don't deny it. I don't see why not, he responds in the next screen capture, Scott Burnell, not exclamation there, he's not seeming so happy anymore, he's like, what's the problem? She returns, I think, or Holly Harrington chimes in, I think we should discuss first, We, sh I think we should discuss first, before opening this can of worms. <laughs> I'm not seeing slash hearing a lot of questions about this, and if we post it, we may create an issue where one does not currently exist. Well, too late, Holly. I'm going to create that issue now. And I found what that issue is, and that's why we're revisiting the Price-Anderson Act. Next screen capture, Elizabeth Hayden, now she chimes back in, agree. I'm not sure why these questions came up anyway. Holly Harrington, I don't remember where the request came from, but at least we have something should we need it down the road. Here's from the 25th of March from Scott Burnell, and they're pulling from the news, and they're looking at a couple articles. One, nuclear industry shielded from big disaster costs in CNN. Regulators to assess safety at Arizona nuclear plant. Okay, I, I guess the first one's probably the most important. Although, like I say, they, they do a lot of searching of social media, of news. They want to know who's saying what about them. In this first particular article they come across, I thought this was important to show because here's what they're concerned about. They don't want us to know how much real damage can be accrued in one of these meltdowns and catastrophic events. And here's just one from a article from CNN Money where it's referring to a 1982 study from Sandia National Laboratories commissioned by the NRC. And it said that disaster could cause 50,000 fatalities and 314 billion in property damage. Okay, remember that number, 314 billion and property damage. Okay, next screen capture from March 25th. This is Holly Harrington again, and she says, so one media outlet did a story on this, prompted by Markey. Okay, that's referring to that we just talked about with the damages and then referring to the Sandy Laboratory. Prompted by Markey, I don't think posting a Q&A would have changed their story. So the only reason to post it would be to allay fears of others. 
I think, personally, that we should wait to see if this story gets any traction. If yes, then we post them. But if not, I think we let sleeping dogs lie. Okay, understand their intentions here and the deception here. They're not forthright with information. Why? Because that information sheds light on the true, diabolical, dangerous nature of nuclear power. Okay, here's uh, Scott... Uh, Burnell, the CNN piece is why we need the Price Anderson QA post. I guess this one came prior to the other one. This is at 7.16 a.m. Okay, so this one was prior to the one I just read. I read those in the wrong order. The CNN piece is why we need the Price Anderson QA posted, he says. I worked with the CNN guy over two days, pushing as hard as I could on why the program's reasonable. But they prefer rabble-rousing, it seems. Okay, and so... Here's again the dynamics here is this piece is prompting them to say, hey, let's do some damage control. Let's do some damage. I tried to control the guy and get him to make it look reasonable, but this guy, see, he's a rabble rouser, right? So we're going to do this set of Q and A's, which can, the question and the answer, they're controlling everything and they're hiding. They're not giving you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in these Q and A's. I'll put it that way. And so he's concerned we need to put these Q and A's out there to do a bit of damage control on the CNN piece. See how this works, folks? They're having to do active damage control and worry about who says what about them. Why? Because the truth hurts. The truth really hurts with nuclear power. And so then she responds and says, I don't think posting it's going to change the effect of the story. And, you know, I think she's probably right in my opinion. Okay, let's look at a screen capture I have from the Robert Alvarez study on spent fuel pools. And he says, I co-authored a report in 2003 that explained how a spent fuel pool fire in the United States could render an area uninhabitable that would be as much as 60 times larger than that created by the Chernobyl accident. If this were to happen at one of the Indian Point nuclear reactors located 25 miles from New York City, it could result in as many as 5,600 cancer deaths and $461 billion in damages. Remember that number? This is the second time we've heard a $450 plus billion dollar Again, this is an estimate. This is a study, but he's estimating, and this is much higher than what we find is covered in the Price Anderson Act. Okay, this next screen capture is from the Q&As that the uh, person from NRC was prompted to do that they never put out in response to a CNN article that did not portray them in such a positive light. Now, why was why was the CNN article, why was he a rabble rouser? Why did not portray them in such a positive light? Well, let's look at the details in this Price Anderson Act. And the number we just looked at was 461 million estimate. Look, cut in half, cut in quarters if you want. Because what Price Anderson covers is if a nuclear accident causes damages of more than 375 million, the insurance is supplemented by additional coverage that is shared by every nuclear power plant in the country. So if, if there's damages over $375 million, which that ain't much, it goes as a larger pool that everyone shares the insurance on this. It says, there are currently 104 reactors licensed to operate in the United States, so the secondary pool of money contains about $12.6 billion. $12.6 billion. I remind you again, the Alvarez study, which I believe that's probably who CNN was looking into. It's the same number, 461 billion. So we look at that and we say, well, let me correct that. I guess the CNN, the Sandia National Laboratories was 314 billion in property damage. And in the Alvarez study from 2003, to clarify, he says 461 billion. So take your pick, 300 billion, 400 something billion, uh, whatever the damages will be in a major accident, it's much more than 12.6 billion. Much more than 12.6 billion. That's a drop in the bucket. That's like you have a car crash and say, here's 100 bucks to fix your car. Be like, look, my door's damaged, my hood's damaged, the quarter panel's busted up, the wheels are hit, the bumper's bad. $100? And then that's how I would, that's the analogy I would use for that. Okay, folks, this uh, ends another Hattrick Penry special report. I hope you enjoyed it and got some information from it. And I want to finish by saying to everyone who's helping right now to get information, truthful information on the Fukushima out, and especially if you're helping to expose this cover-up, the silver bullet plume gate, which is what we're going to use against them in their own words to break the back of the conspiracy and shut down nuclear power in one fell swoop. It's inevitable because, like I say, uh, give me a nuclear-free world or give me death. And that's really 
It's one or the other. You're either going to get a nuclear-free world or death is going to come to you in the form of cancer from fallout because fallout is cancer. That's what Kevin Blanche says, and he's absolutely right. Okay, folks, Patrick Penry, thanks for joining me for another broadcast. Have an excellent day. Over and out. This is an HP News Network special report. We need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.